You can see my uh, photo now, right? Mm -hmm. So um, people have been clay printing uh, in, in sort of an open source ad hoc way for about 10 years. Uh, my friend Jonathan Keep and my friend Dries Verbruggen, who are in England and um, uh, Belgium, respectively, were some of the earliest people to do that. There were some research projects prior to them way back that involved clay printing, but not really in an art or design context, more in a, a scientific context. So I uh, got interested in 3D printing around 2000 eight or so, um, or at least that's when I got access to uh, the first time I was able to print something. And uh, it took a lot of years before I felt like, oh, I want to switch over now from doing things in plastic to clay, just because the complication of it was, was really tricky. So the first time I tried to make a clay extruder, I designed this thing here, which didn't work particularly well. But it would, the idea was that I would like strap it onto an existing printer like the ones that we're using. Um, and so it was able to like dump, um, it was able to dump clay out, but it didn't really form objects. It was more, um, wait for it, more just a, a thing that sprayed clay onto the table. Um, so it wasn't super exciting, but for me, that was like a big deal. The printer was, you know, it, it, I had told it to, to extrude clay and it did. And so um, this is a printer that is a, a homemade version that's very similar to the Prusa printers that we use and it has this thing strapped onto and it looks really cool but it never really did work um, and that was about five years ago I got interested in this and then um, I kept tinkering around tinkering around with this I build these printers from kits and then would just kind of invent or um, borrow open source designs and modify them to try and make it work so here the clay comes through a big tube or at least it's supposed to and goes right to the nozzle and prints and we got that working. I worked with engineering students at um, Penn State. There's an awesome um, program called the Learning Factory. Uh, Sheila, you may be familiar with the Learning Factory. You maybe participated in it. Um, so I had uh, a group of, I sponsored a group of like five or six engineering students. We would meet once a week to try and, you know, hook this up, to try and make this work, basically. And we actually made a lot of progress that, um, that first year. And so, um, we didn't have a great way to get the clay to the printer. So um, I've, I'm pretty sure I'm the only person in the world who ever used this particular system for feeding the printer where I had a caulk gun and as it's moving around, I would just pump this thing to get the clay to come out, um, which actually did work, um, but it's not advisable. Uh, it didn't work particularly well. And then eventually we hooked this up to an air compressor and a lot of people do printing this way with an air compressor. It freaked me out because it's noisy and it's an insane amount of pressure that you need and I was always worried about blowing something up. Um, so I did a whole nother uh, semester with the Learning Factory uh, engineering students and I had this wonderful student named Nick who's in this picture who built this kind of mechanical RAM system uh, that was quite elaborate. It had all these little speed dials and, and switches on it and this gigantic motor that we were joking like he stole out of a Toyota Prius or something. Um, and, and it would just push this clay with this giant piston and then it would go through the hose and it would print um, on the printer. Um, and so we just made like more and more elaborate versions of that, um, like this one here. And I don't know how well video works in these presentations, so I might skip through this. This is a video of this printing. Um, and then we try to make a two color version. We were getting a little bit ahead of ourselves because um, the printer wasn't working that great anyway. So doubling it was maybe not the best idea, but it was kind of like, you know, something we wanted to do. Um, and then I started to um, look at designs that had a print bed that moved in both the X and Y axis, which is what's happening here. And the reason why was because um, clay weighs a lot and pushing it through a hose was, was really tricky. And so we really liked the idea that the um, print head could just move up and down, that it wouldn't have to move left and right like it does uh, on the printers that we use, that that would be a much simpler um, mechanism for doing that. And so the printer then started to be not based on this Prusa design, but basically just made out of all kinds of aluminum extrusion. I really got into this stuff, obviously devoted an insane amount of hours to it over a, a period of years. Um, and just sort of would try and make incremental improvements. One thing that's interesting about clay is like you can extrude it at whatever diameter. So this here has got to be like an inch thick. Um, I've never like made artwork that has inch thick extrusions, but you could, um, which is interesting. I don't know that you could do that with plastic very easily. You would need some crazy heater uh, to melt that quantity of plastic and would probably have a pretty high level of toxicity to it. Um, 
and so this thing just grew and grew and um, eventually we got some really nice prints out of it. I was kind of surprised to look back at how nice the um, surface quality on this is because it's from a few years ago and you like to think you're always improving on stuff. Um, so this doesn't have all those oscillations that Audrey was talking about in her print today. Uh, and it's the same sort of print head. So um, a lot of this just has to do with your settings and your speeds and things like that. I had a student, Preston Van Allen, who made basically a duplicate of this printer, which was really nice to have someone else working on it for a while and kind of, you know, developing their own version of it. And then um, I had gotten a grant a few years ago, along with some other, uh, a, a faculty member in engineering and a faculty member in art education, to kind of go to all the different Penn State campuses and talk about 3D printing and, and um, maker spaces and things like that. So we wanted to make a portable version of this um, and sort of set about doing that. Um, this is like a partial view of 3D printed plastic parts that we've used uh, as clay printer parts. So one of the really nice things about having all these um, printers around is you can just dream up uh, gears and fittings and mechanisms and print them. And when they don't work, you just make another one or you iterate them or something like that. So I do like to collect just boxes and boxes of these things as we kind of work through, you know, what works and what doesn't. And a lot of these are, are the extruder part of the printer. And I'm still using a, a design that's based on these, but it's had like a hundred iterations since then. So this is the version we made to be able to like go to the different campuses. I got a little carried away with putting bicycle wheels on it and stuff, um, but it did work pretty well. It's extremely heavy. Um, so that, that part was tricky, but we were able to take it to different Penn State campuses and kind of show how this works along with showing how 3D printing works and teaching people some basic 3D modeling and, and things like that. The idea being that um, some of the uh, Commonwealth campuses would have less access to um, digital fabrication tools than you have up here at University Park. Um, you get a flat tire, you can fill it up. Uh, we started making components uh, out of aluminum, which is a really nice uh, thing to be able to do. And just as, a, uh, as an aside, um, we have access to a CNC mill in uh, Sova when we're on campus and in the Stuckman Architecture School. And we are finding that there's so much pressure in the clay printer that like things would break or bend or fall apart. So we started having to make like reinforced aluminum uh, components and that was kind of a fun uh, part again that we sort of went overboard with. Um, so this just gets more and more chunky and heavy and sort of overbuilt, but that stabilized the whole design and made it less shaky and, and have less vibration and things like that. So over time, we got to be able to do really good detail like the objects that we we're showing today where we have um, a one millimeter nozzle or smaller. Um, if you look at the few uh, commercially available clay printers that are out there, quite often uh, they have a two, three, four uh, millimeter nozzle. Um, it's I, in my opinion, trickier and maybe more interesting to use a smaller nozzle like what we use for plastic because you could get relatively a lot more detail. Um, and we played around a little bit with trying to make some large objects too, but it's hard because clay weighs a lot. So to make a tall thing, you have to like empty the whole tube of clay and then pause the print and load a whole nother one and then empty that tube and load a whole nother one. Um, that part is tricky. Um, so there's that milling process. Um, I, after a couple of years break, I did go back and work with Learning Factory students again, uh, this time to do a two color printer. Uh, and we did get it working really pretty well uh, most recently where we have, uh, you know, I have like brown and a different brown here, but in theory, there could be other, uh, any, any two colors of clay in there. Um, and you can sort of see, uh, this is a bit rough, but you can see that the, um, the two color printing process is working. Um, and whether it's, Significant or not, I don't know, but there are very few um, examples of, of multiple color clay printing out there. So it was fun to, to be in a kind of uncharted territory with that. Um, and as I mentioned, over time, um, the quality of this just got better and better. Um, and it was fun to kind of push it. So hopefully this video is working um, where you're at, but you can see that this, um, like plastic, is able to bridge right about to a, a 45 degree angle as long as the clay stays sort of adhered to the base that it's on. Uh, so you can see a little bit of sagging there where it kind of goes together, but we were able to print this little vault form. Um, and my architecture colleagues were excited about that because they want to do that at like house scale somehow. Um, and so again, you know, the, the process of this is super similar to the plastic printing. It's basically identical. I'm using the same software, 
but generally the extrusion is larger. Uh, and so in some interesting ways, it's kind of more fun to watch because you're just watching a lot more material going down uh, as you're doing it. And a lot of objects have this kind of infill and you can vary the amount of that. So you could make an object totally solid or totally hollow or really anywhere in between with a kind of grid network in the inside. And that goes for plastic or for clay. Um, so most recently uh, made kind of an, an additional version of this printer that's smaller but more accurate. Um, and it's just been a whole process um, over the years, I've really learned a lot about these motors and control boards and all these different types of, um, you know, ways that you can power these things and use aluminum to reinforce them. Uh, I did have some of the Learning Factory students make me some custom parts, which was really cool. So this object here where my cursor is, is a custom part that we had to have 3D printed in metal. It works really great, but it was super cost prohibitive. I think it was like 60 or $80 to make this one little piece. Um, and we actually needed it to be a little bit bigger. And so some of the engineering students were able to mill from a block of um, aluminum this, this uh, you know, complete piece. It's just a, a motor adapter piece, but the whole thing kind of wouldn't work without that. Um, so it's, quite, it's been quite a production um, and it starts to look really uh, industrial. Um, and, and now it's a really strong machine that doesn't like buckle under its own pressure or anything like that. And it's run by this really fancy uh, control board um, that can that can run all kinds of interesting uh, sophisticated equipment um, and now we've gotten the two color process really clean this is a teeny tiny little test tile in clay maybe like one inch tall um, so we've been able to get um, a super fine uh, resolution of multicolored clay I always make it seem like this stuff uh, is fairly easy to get it to work all this stuff takes a, a lot of setup and cleanup um, but it has felt like over time, uh, as you make little incremental improvements, it gets a little bit easier to get good results with, with this whole process. So um, there's two print heads here. Uh, one lifts up and out of the way while the other one is printing so that it doesn't smear what the last one did. Um, and that has allowed us to make really clean uh, sort of multicolor um, things. So you can see here in close up, this is probably like a one millimeter nozzle. So like twice as thick, as the plastic, but maybe half as thick as um, some other clay printers that, that we've worked with. Um, and I don't know if this video will um, kick in or not, but it basically just shows this little process of um, switching the colors. And if this doesn't start in the next five seconds, I'm gonna move along. Okay, video. Uh, and this is uh, the clay printer as it looks now. Um, it's, it's right over here to my right. Um, and uh, it has a relatively small build volume. Actually, the build volume is quite similar to the plastic printers that we have. One of the things I would like to do is build a larger one color version that's super stable and uh, eventually get that back into our ceramic studio on campus when we're sort of, you know, back into normal um, campus access mode. Um, so anyway, uh, that's what that looks like. Um, this is, um, I think this is that video that I linked to, um, and it just shows you, you know, sort of like what that, um, what that looks like as it's printing. So the bed moves on the X and the Y, and all the print head has to do is like go up or down. Um, but it is, it's been quite a process. Uh, but I don't know, I really enjoy making the tool itself, making the tool that makes the thing. And one thing that's been nice about that, despite it eating up literally thousands of hours, is that um, I, I have enough confidence in this now that I can kind of like build it to suit what I want to make. So I'm not um, stuck with whatever a manufacturer would provide in terms of what the thing can do. I can just kind of alter it uh, to do what we want to do with it. And so I was really happy that all these prints worked out over the weekend. That's really the first time um, since I've started teaching this class that we've been able to get like quick and, and repeatable quality results. It's always been a crapshoot in the past where if we try and print five things, like maybe one and a half of them work uh, and it ends up wasting a lot of time. So anyway, um, that's some background in that. Uh, you could be as interested or not interested in clay printing as you wanna be. It's not essential to this course, but it's something that's like really fundamental and essential to me. Uh, so just so you know where I'm coming from and what I'm into, um, that is that.